So the second conclusion that we're going to talk about is that for each characteristic, many organisms have two alleles. Now, this is not true for all organisms, but the reasons we're going to talk about it for two, two, as most organisms having two alleles makes sense because when you look at the chromosomes on the inside of the cell, and here we've organized, for example, the chromosomes from a fruit fly. They have four pairs of chromosomes, the green pair, the red pair, this small pair, and this other pair. And so on each of those chromosomes, you have a version of the gene. Sometimes it's the exact same version of the gene, <clears throat> and so it, um, it, uh, it codes for and then is expressed as a phenotype one allele, one version of the gene, one form of the gene. But you also could be where you have one version of the gene on one chromosome and another version of the gene on another chromosome. But it's this, it's this play of having two chromosomes that, that, um, that leads into this conclusion that most organisms seem to have two alleles. This is also the case for uh, things like humans, right, like us. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So we get one chromosome from mom and one chromosome from dad, and they come together in when the egg and sperm are uh, come together in fertilization, and now you have a full set, 23 pairs of chromosomes. 22 of them are called autosomes, and then the 23rd pair is the are the sex chromosomes where if you're a girl you're XX and if you're a boy you're XY. But I want to point out that not all organisms have two pairs of chromosomes. Some organisms are haploid where they only have one of the numbered chromosomes. Some organisms like us and like fruit flies are diploid where they have paired chromosomes. Other organisms are triploid or tetrapoid. For example, the salmon is a tetraploid organism. Wheat is a hectoploid or organism, so they have six pairs of chromosomes. And stra some strawberries have ten pairs of chromosomes. The third conclusion is that gametes carry only one allele for each inherited characteristic. So when an organism goes through the process of making eggs and sperm, those gametes are going to carry one of the alleles in, this, in, this, in the systems that we've been talking about. Like, so a fruit fly's eggs are only going to have either uh, eggs and sperm or are going to have only one of the chromosomes. The same is also true for humans, right? When, when males make sperm, they are either going to have the X chromosome or the Y chromosome. They will not have both. When females make eggs, they are only going to have one of the X chromosomes. And the same is true for all of the other autosomal pairs. The gametes only have one of those chromosomes. And so therefore, gametes only carry one allele for each inherited characteristic. The fourth conclusion is that alleles can either be dominant or recessive. So remember that in the case of the fruit flies, having wings is dominant to not having these wings or having the vestigial form. So the dominant phenotype is expressed if you have at least one of the alleles. You can have both, right? Each chromosome could have the, have the dominant allele, for example, the allele for wings. But if you only have one of, uh, if you have one allele that's dominant and one that is recessive, you still express the dominant phenotype. However, the recessive phenotype is only expressed when both, both alleles are recessive. Okay, so let's now imagine a population of fruit flies, and we go in and look at it, so many more than just these four. But I'm showing you representatives of this population, and you notice that there are lots of fruit flies that have red eyes and wings, lots of fruit flies that have dark eyes and wings, lots of fruit flies that have red eyes and vestigial wings, or no wings, and lots of fruit flies that have the dark eyes and vestigial wings. And let's assume that I pull out one of these fruit flies that has red eyes and wings, and I ask you, what are the possible genotypes, underlying genotypes, of the phenotype that you're seeing, the red-eyed winged fruit fly? And to help you annotate 
the genotype, we're going to use the, this notation, where big N refers to the allele for normal wing, little n refers to the allele for vestigial wing, big R refers to the allele for red eyes, and little r refers for the allele for dark eyes. Now remember that each fruit fly is that fruit flies are diploid, so they are going to have two alleles for each characteristic. So what are the possible combinations for a red-eyed winged fruit fly? Well, they are big R, big R, little n, or I'm sorry, big N, big N, big R, little r, big N, big N, big R, big R, big N, little n, and big R, little r, big N, little n. Those are the four possible genotypes that can result in the red-eyed winged fruit fly. Let's do the same thing for the dark-eyed winged fruit fly. What are the possible genotypes? Little r, little r, big N, big N. And little r, little r, big N, little n. And for the red-eyed vestigial, big R, big R, little n, little n. And big R, little r, little n, little n. And finally, for the dark-eyed vestigial wing, there's only one genotype that, is, that can possibly make that phenotype. It is little r, little r, little n, little n. Now this brings up two terms also that you should be familiar with, homozygous and heterozygous. Homozygous means that at, for a characteristic, you carry the same two alleles. So you can be homozygous dominant, like big R, big R, or homozygous recessive, like little r, little r. Heterozygous means that you carry one of each alleles, so like big R, little r. Imagine this question. What is the genotype of the parents that are that is a red-eyed winged fruit fly and a red-eyed winged fruit fly? Okay. Now, you don't know what the genotypes are. You know the four possible genotypes, but you don't know their genotypes. Could we look at the offspring and somehow get an indication of what the parents might be? This is sometimes referred to as a test cross, where you cross them and then you can look back and sometimes infer what the parents might have been. Well, if in the F1 generation we get all four possible phenotypes, what then are the genotypes of the parents? Well, the only possible answer is that these parents are big R, little r, big N, little n, because only those combinations could produce the double um, recessive, the homozygous recessive for both characteristics, because they both would have to have the be carriers of that recessive characteristic. A carrier is an organism who is heterozygous at a site and therefore carries one of the recessive alleles. I now want to talk a little bit about probability and genetics. Recall that we have 22 autosomes and then we have our sex chromosomes, and they can either be XX or XY. Well, what's the chance that a sperm that is an X sperm fertilizes a, a, an X egg? Well, from the female, the female is always giving eggs that are going to have the X chromosome. So it's the male that actually determines the sex of babies. What's the chance? Well, you might say it's 50-50, right? It's a coin toss. Uh, and, and that's exactly right. The probability of having a boy or a girl is essentially 50%. So there are some rules that go along with probability. When you talk about multiple independent events and what are the chances of you know having a boy and then having a girl or having a boy and then having another boy, we, we can use these different rules. The first rule is called the rule of addition. When you add probabilities, or you add probabilities when your chances get better of an event occurring. And you use this when you're when you're talking about like when it doesn't matter what order the events come in, or what doesn't matter which parent the gene comes from. Or for example, when you say or. So if you say, what are the chances if I'm if my if if my wife and I are uh, expecting a baby, what are the chances that we have a boy or a girl? Well, it sounds kind of silly, right? But the chances are, well, it's 50% to have a boy, and it's 50% to have a girl. So if I use the or in between, it's actually 100%, right? Because I have a 100% chance of having a boy or a girl. Well, what are the, if, if though we start to say things like, what's the chance of having a boy the first time and then a girl, that's different. This is where we have to talk about the rule of multiplication where you multiply probabilities when your chances get worse of an event occurring.
So this is when the order does uh, does matter, or when both events must occur. So if I say, what's the chance of a boy and then a girl? It's, well, what's the chance of a boy in the first, in the first pregnancy? 50%. What's the chance of a girl in the second pregnancy? 50%. So what's the chance of having a boy and then a girl? Well, it's 50% times 50% or 0.5 times 0.5 which is 0.25 which is 25% chance. We can also think about probability in, in as we do these crosses. So here's a question. What is the probability of getting a vestigial wing offspring if these are the two genotypes of the parents? So you look at that and you think well Really what I have to say is what's the probability of this? Yeah, I need to get a vestigial wing offspring. So that's an offspring that has a little n, little n. So therefore, I have to say what's the probability of getting a little n from this fruit fly? That's 50%. And what's the probability of getting a little n from this fruit fly? That's 50%. So now I can just say I, I'm, I need both of those to occur. So therefore, it's 0.5 times 0.5 or 0.25, 25% chance. And this is one way of doing genetics problems. Another way that is also very common is using Punnett squares. And with Punnett squares, you must always begin with this question. What types of gametes can the individual make? So if we ask ourselves the question, what types of gametes can this individual make that is big N, little n, knowing that that those ends are going to be separated during the process of making gametes and each gamete is either going to have a big N or a little n. Well, you, you, the way that you do this then is you ask that question, what types of gametes can the individual make? You draw your square and then you put the possible gametes along the sides of the square. So in this case, it's a, the possible gametes are a big N and a little n. The same is true also from the other um, parent, parent who is a big N, little n. So you put those along the sides, and then you can basically bring those down together, and you can say, okay, big N and big N, that's one possible genotype. We also have big N, little n, that's another possible genotype, and we have little n, little n as another possible genotype. And the other value that you get out of doing a Punnett square is that you can now determine also the chances or the probabilities as well, because you can use this and say, well, one quarter of the offspring are going to be big N, big N, one quarter or two, um, two quarters or one half of the offspring are going to be big N, little n, and a quarter of the offspring are going to be little n, little n. So that's how we talk about the genotypes. But we also can talk about this in terms of the phenotypes. What's the probability of, again, getting a vestigial wing offspring was the original question. So there we're asking about the phenotypes. What's the probability of getting a phenotype that has vestigial wings? Well, the only um, fruit flies that have vestigial wings are little n, little n genotype individuals. So that happens to be 25% of the total possible offsprings. So one quarter of the offspring will have vestigial wings. So that is a quick introduction to genetics and some of the major conclusions that the original investigators in genetics have learned. Also some ways that we can figure out some of the questions and, and that you are going to be faced with in genetics using both probabilities and Punnett squares.